speak a word. Speak his name. He'll find you. Nobody else may be able to find you, but God will find you. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm going to be reading from Genesis chapter 4 this morning. This story takes place sometime after Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden for their own safety. Genesis 4 and verse 1, Adam knew Eve, his wife, she conceived and bare Cain, said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. She again bare his brother Abel. Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of ground. In process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock, of the fat thereof. Somewhere, Cain and Abel got the idea that when they come to God, they should come with an offering, a sacrifice, a gift. Being that the population of the world was very low at this time, I'm going to say it came from Adam and Eve. And so in the process of time, they grew up, this is years now after They've been out of the Garden of Eden. Of course, Abel and Cain never were in, in the garden. But they bring their offerings, and the Lord had respect unto Abel to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering, he had not respect. And that ticked Cain off. He was very wroth. His countenance fell. The Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? Why are you upset? Why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, shall you not be accepted? So we get a clue that Cain wasn't doing well. However, God defined well. He said, And if you don't do well, Sin lies at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire. In other words, sin is going to rule over you when you should rule over him. Amen. Hebrews 11 and verse 4, the writer said that by faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. So Cain's sacrifice had to be excellent by some standard, but Abel's sacrifice was more excellent. And being excellent wasn't good enough for God to accept Cain's sacrifice. He had to Go to Abel's sacrifice to accept it. And of course, when God accepts your sacrifice, He accepts you. If God doesn't accept your sacrifice, He doesn't accept you. Cain was not accepted. His sacrifice was not accepted. Abel, on the other hand, the Lord had respect to Abel and to his offering. So I'm just going to talk this morning a little bit about when God looks for a gift. When God looks for a gift. Lord Jesus, let your word minister today. 
And Lord, help us to offer the gift that you accept, that you respect, that you bless. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. You may be seated. The Bible makes a lot of references, especially in the Old Testament, to different types of offerings and sacrifices that were offered up to God. It talks about burnt offerings and wave offerings, meat offerings and drink offerings, heave offerings and free will offerings. It just was a lot of types of sacrifices that it also called offerings. Uh, that it also called gifts. The law of Moses referred to them even as gifts. Leviticus 23 and verse 8 uh, refers to certain sacrifices as being gifts when you bring your gifts to God. In fact, when Jesus uh, referred to some of the sacrifices that, that uh, you had to offer up by the law of Moses, he also referred to them as gifts, as in one case where he talked to a leper and and he healed the leper, and he told the leper, now, don't tell anybody about this yet. First, go to the priest and bring the gifts that Moses commanded. Bring the gift that Moses commanded. So he's talking about the sacrifice. You go back to the law of Moses when somebody was a leper, and they thought that maybe the leper was cleansed or whatever. They had to go to the priest because they had to be pronounced clean by the priest. And the priest had to go through a certain uh, ritual or routine. Uh, and in all of that, it included that they had to bring a sacrifice or, as Jesus referred here, a gift. Um, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 4, in reference to various sacrifices or offerings that were offered up to God, also uses the word gifts that were commanded by the law. So there, were certain, there was a knowledge that when you come to God, you bring a gift. Um, not because God needs your gift, not because he is desperate for your, your, your bullock that you offer up as a sacrifice. Why, he has the cattle on a thousand hills. Your bullock isn't going to make that much of a difference. Right? You know, you bring your gold and your silver, but the Bible says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The gold and the, and the silver, all of that belongs to God. So you bring in your little bit of gold isn't going to do God a whole lot of good. In fact, God has a new city waiting on us where the street is paved with gold, where there are walls of jasper, where there's jewels of every kind. So it's not like God needs your gold or silver in order maybe to help pay, but that's already taken care of. In fact, the thing about God is he could really, if he wanted more gold and silver, he could speak it into existence. And yet he looks for a gift. Oh, at a time when uh, the children of Israel were in trouble by the Syrian army and uh, uh, they prayed and prophecy went forth. And the Bible says that the angel of the Lord went out uh, at night and, and wiped out 185,000 soldiers overnight. Woke, woke up, 185,000 corpses, just all dead men. That was a great victory that Israel didn't have to fight for. And afterwards, their response was, the Bible says that the, many brought gifts to the Lord. They came with their sacrifices and their offerings. Even in the New Testament, when, when uh, Jesus was born, uh, we tend to make a big thing about this in about, you know, six months' time or more. And, uh, but the, we talk about the wise men, and they brought their gifts, and there was gold and frankincense and myrrh, right? They came to worship the one that was born the king of the Jews. They came to worship the Messiah that had been prophesied through the ages, and they came with a gift. I don't know if there was two or three of them, or if there was 20 or 30 of them, uh, but because the Bible mentions three gifts, we say there's three wise men. But however many there was, it doesn't matter. They brought gifts. Um, so again, God doesn't look for a gift. 
because it's going to give him some benefit. But he looks for a gift because it is what's going to unlock things for you. It's about a benefit for you. That's how this works. Uh, because when God looks to bless, he looks to bless things that reflect him. So if you reflect him, there's blessing that's going to come your way. If you don't, then no. And Cain, his offering wasn't accepted. It did not reflect God. But Abel's sacrifice did reflect God. And so God had respect to Abel and to his offering, but not to Cain. So the thing that we know about God, one of the things we know about God, is that God is a giver. God is a blesser. God, that, that's just part of the nature of God. Not like some of the pagan gods that demand things for their own benefit, but, but, but God is a giver. And you can never outgive God. It is in his nature to give. There's a song that we have sung before that says, uh, "He that you are God, the only sovereign God. You are everlasting, ever loving, and the ever giving God because that is part of his nature. And if you want God's blessing to come to you, you recognize you become like him. The gift is not a manipulation like you can do with other gods or kings or politicians or whatever where you can offer up a bribe or you can do something that that then they're going to do they're going to scratch your back as well no because with God he's not going to give in to the to the flattery he looks to the heart of man he sees what is really there now it's his nature to give and so he causes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust not just the just but the unjust, even the ones that are wicked, they still get the rain to fall on their crops and it gets to grow. Uh, even the wicked, their eyes still continue to see. Their heart still begins to pump. They still breathe God's air, all the while cursing God and saying there is no God and whatever else they may boast about. And, and yet God in his mercy, because he is a giver, he still causes it to rain on the just and the un unjust. He is a provider. He provides. He provides protection. He gives blessing. He gives healing. He gives miracles. Uh, he gives salvation. That's why it's better to give than to receive. Because when you give, you're becoming more like him. Now, we know that with when it comes to gifts, it's we, we use the, the, the old adage, it's the thought that counts, right? So we've got a number of parents in here, parents that have been parents of young children, and some of you still are parents of young children. And so, and maybe this happened just last week. Uh, we did have Mother's Day, but come that or, or, or some other special occasion, a birthday, Christmas, whatever, uh, they will, you know, come up with some little drawing that they gave to you, and, and you're like, oh, that's so sweet. What is it? Right? Because they're no Picasso. They're no Rembrandt. I mean, they might have talent for a six-year-old, but they just, they don't have it like, like, you know, like what we've seen. And so they explain to you, oh, uh, this is Superman flying through here, and he's fighting this dragon over there, and they're going to tell you all what it is. And, oh, well, that's so sweet. And you give them a hug, and, and you love the gift. Might even put it up on the fridge. Not because the gift was that great, but you're touched by the thought that they had. I'm going to give this to mom. I'm going to give this to dad. Right? So it's a thought that counts. Um, and, and so when we offer our gift, the one question I want to bring to you this morning is, what is the thought behind your gift? So I'll let you chew on that while I go on to the next point. And that is a giver knows the value of their gift, right? You know what you paid for that gift. You know if you had to bid a million and a half dollars at an art, art auction where there were a bunch of other folks that were uh, as ignorant as you and decided to blow a bunch of money, 
because it's a great laundering scheme. Um, <laughs> um, or if you got that at the garage sale down the street for 50 cents, right? You know what you paid for. In fact, a lot of times what we do when we give a gift, we, you know, we cut off the price tag, we remove it, the sticker that says what we paid for it, right? Why? Because it, it's not about the price, it's about the gift, the thought that counts, right? That's what we say. And yet we know the price of the gift. Now with God, even when we're giving God a gift, God knows, always knows the price of a gift. Um, and, of course, if your child comes up to you and gives you something and he wants to tell you this is a million-dollar piece of bubble gum, uh, you might say yes, but you know, really, that cost a nickel down at the store. Okay, with the inflation nowadays, maybe five bucks. But, uh, but you know, you know, but the giver knows for sure the value of the gift. And so that is why some gifts were not accepted, not by God. Um, and, and people had this concept when they went to the priest or when they went to the prophet, uh, they would bring a gift, right? So King Saul, before he was a king, he, his, the, his father's donkeys got lost. They were trying to find him, couldn't find him. They heard that there was the prophet Samuel nearby. And so like, oh, well, let's go to him. But Saul was like, well, hold on. I, I don't have anything to give the prophet. I don't have a gift. They had this understanding you needed to bring a gift, not to bribe the prophet, but there was something about the principle of giving to God. And another occasion, even a pagan uh, guy named uh, Naaman, who was a great general for the Syrian army, when he needed healing from leprosy and found out about a certain prophet named Elisha, he didn't know who the guy was, but a certain prophet that could heal him of the leprosy, he went there, and when he went, he came with a whole bunch of gifts. And you know how much of it Elisha took? None of it, because Naaman's heart wasn't right. So God went to working on Naaman's heart. And uh, now, Hazel, then he went out and he got the gifts uh, that he should not have received. There was trouble with that. But, but uh, Naaman, he was all expecting Elisha to come out and, and uh, I don't know, blow a trumpet or, or, you know, proclaim the greatness of Naaman and accept his gifts and, and be be ever beholden for the rest of his life because you have now made me a multimillionaire and so I'll give you whatever you want. No. Elisha didn't even answer the door. He said, to a servant, Gehazi, why don't you go answer the door and tell him, go dip himself in the dirtiest river around here, the Jordan River. And, uh, and that kind of upset Naaman, and a lot of you know the story. Um, but he came, even he came with the knowledge, I need to bring a gift. So the giver knows the gift, but God did not accept all gifts that come to him. In fact, in some cases, God rejected it and didn't want it and said, I'm not going to have it. It's an abomination to me or, or whatever. In, in one case where Ezekiel is prophesying, he rejected the gifts of the people because the people that were offering the gifts uh, were still causing their children to go through the fire while they worshiped and served Moloch, another god, a false god. And, uh, and so God says, you know what? I don't want your gift. He says, you offer your gifts, but you make your sons to pass through the fire, and you pollute yourselves with all your idols. He said, Am I, and you want to, be, uh, to come to me for an answer? You're wanting me to come through for you? He said, it ain't going to be so. As I live, I will not be inquired of you. I'm not going to listen to a single request you have. Because you see, God doesn't accept every gift. Well, Jesus was talking to some folks of his day, and uh, in Matthew chapter 5, he said, if you're going to come bring your gift to the altar, you got your sacrifice, you're going to bring it to the altar, and while you're there, you remember that your brother has ought against you. Your brother is holding a grudge against you because of something that happened. He said... Don't take your gift back. That's what a lot of people, oh, I'm going to take my gift back, you know. No, no, leave the gift there because you've already said that belongs to God by your action and by your intention. Leave your gift there, but go your way and first be reconciled to your brother and then come 
and offer the gift or perform the sacrifice. So otherwise the sacrifice wasn't going to be accepted because God looks for something deeper. Now back to the the children of Israel when Ezekiel is talking to them, um, he he tells them, Ezekiel chapter 20, uh, he tells them that um, uh, for you, house of Israel, at this point, he is done with them because they're insistent on serving their idols. They're, they're, they're abusing their children just like many do today. They cause their children to be harmed as they serve other interests, serve other gods. And they pursue these other gods. And, and in doing that, uh, God said, I'm not going to be inquired of you. So if you're intent on doing that, uh, then go ahead. You serve your idols. I'm not going to hearken uh, uh, to you. Don't, don't, hark, don't worry about listening to me. Don't just, he said, just don't pollute my holy name anymore with your gifts or with your idols. In my holy mountain. There will I accept my gifts. In my holy mountain, in the mountain where I speak to you, where you're going to receive me, where you're going to hear my law, where you're going to follow my word. So not all gifts are uh, accepted by God as Cain's wasn't. Psalm uh, Psalm 66 verse 13, he said, I will go into your house. With burnt offerings, all right, that's good. But then to a, a couple verses later, verse 18, he said, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. The Lord will not hear me. Why are there so many unanswered prayers? Iniquity in our heart. The prophet Isaiah said, God speaking, he said, My ear is not heavy that it cannot hear. It's not that my arm is shortened that it cannot save, but it's your iniquities that have separated you from me. So even though they call out to God, they still didn't get their miracle, their answer, because of their iniquities. Proverbs 15 and verse 8 says, The sacrifice, oh, this is good, sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. But the prayer of the upright is his delight. The upright. See, that is the key for why is it that the uh, prayer, the fervent prayer of a righteous man is going to accomplish a whole lot. It's because there's righteousness there. And God seeks to bless that which reflects him. To bless that which reflects his glory, his goodness. That's what he wants to multiply. He's not trying to multiply transgression. He's not trying to multiply iniquity. He's not trying to multiply sin or idolatry or anything. He wants to multiply that which brings life. He's a giver. He's a blesser. Proverbs 21, 27. The sacrifice of the wicked is abomination. Second time he says that. How much more when he brings it with a wicked mind. So there's always been the gifts that we've brought to God. There's always been the things that we, the sacrifices that we make to God. Those, those things have always existed. And, and uh, when in, even in the New Testament church, they would bring sacrifices or, or not like animal sacrifices, but they would bring their offerings. Uh, uh, they, they gave freely uh, at uh, one point, a couple of points. The Bible makes mention where uh, they would uh, sell their properties, those that had extra pieces of properties, just to be able to help finance the work of God. I mean, they're, they're not just giving like a little, you know, here's a little offering. They were, they were sacrificially giving. They wanted to bless the kingdom of God. And uh, they would take up offerings at times, like there was a, a famine that happened. The book of Acts talks about, and, and Paul was uh, one of the ones commissioned to help bring an offering down to the churches in Judea where there, the famine was greatly affecting them, and, and they had no, no money and no, no food and whatever. So they, they brought it up. And there were other times in Paul's ministry where uh, offerings were done. And sometimes churches would help support his ministry as he went to other cities to establish the church, uh, the churches to preach the gospel and so forth. And, and uh, when he wrote to the Philippian church, though, in Philippians chapter 4, he said, he talked about how you ministered to me, you, you gave to me, you helped me out even when I was in Thessalonica and so forth. He said, and, and I'm not saying this because I want gifts from you. 
He said, but what I do want is fruit that might abound to your account. What I do want, what I am happy about is that I know that when you give, there's going to be fruit that comes to you. Why? Because God looks for certain things in a gift. And when he sees those things, then God blesses. And fruit comes to you. And when God blesses, you are blessed. You're blessed indeed and not like anybody else. No wonder Psalm 54 and verse 6, the psalmist says, I will freely sacrifice unto thee. Some people do it very uh, uh, sparingly, but this psalmist said, I'm going to do it freely unto you. Uh, And then he specifies a little more. He says, I will praise your name, O Lord, for it is good. There is something about our praise that ought to be more than just a little extra that we give every now and then, but that it comes from all that we have. Bible does make mention about the sacrifice of praise. And, uh, uh, you know, in fact, Hebrews 13, 15, let us all con- offer continually the sacrifice of praise. And then he specifies that is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. There's something about when we give it. Now, now, now some people, I know, I know it's just drawing near to God with their mouth, but their heart is far from him. Well, that's where God looks at the sacrifice to decide whether or not he accepts it, to decide whether or not he receives it. But when there is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name, and where there is sometimes a sacrifice of praise because it it, it's a real effort to do, sometimes it's easy, right? You're at a conference and they got great music and whatever's going on and, and praise just seems easy. And other times it just seems like it's tough. Offer. The sacrifice of praise. Jesus came to a uh, to a town where, when he got there, there were a couple of actually, there were ten lepers that uh, uh, needed healing, that wanted healing, that cried out to him, "Jesus, have mercy on us!" and uh, and so. He, he was like, okay, I'll, uh, I'll do it. But what you need to do is go show yourself unto the priest. Why? Because Jesus didn't come to destroy the law. He came to fulfill the law. And while they're on their way going to the priest, they start noticing, hey, the infection I noticed there this morning isn't there. And, hey, it's not there either. And after a while, they're I don't have any, all the leprosy, it's it stopped. In, and they're like, wow, this is great. And one of them was like, oh, this is great. He's like, I got to go back and I got to tell Jesus. I got to thank him. And he came back and he fell down on his face and, and he worshiped him and he gave thanks. And, and Jesus was like, hey, this is great. Um, wasn't there ten of you? And where's the other nine? Only one returned to give thanks. Jesus is like, all right, since you decided to give something, I'm going to give you something extra. Go your way. Your faith has made you whole. So whatever parts of his body he may have lost, a finger here, part of a nose there, bottom lip, I don't know. uh, But whatever it was that was missing beforehand, now he is made whole. It isn't just the leprosy stopped and no longer working. Now he is made whole. Why? Because he came to Jesus uh, with a worship, a heart that was full, uh, and, 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 and he gave a sacrifice. Amen. There's another time where Jesus is teaching the crowd. And teaching the crowd, he's teaching them all day. We're going to try that today. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but uh, we're going to, he's teaching them all day, and it was getting to a point where it's getting kind of a little late. And the disciples came to him and, Psst, Master, uh, it is kind of late. Notice where the sun is. Maybe, maybe we can um, send them home so they can get something to eat because they're going to need to eat something. Jesus was like, well, why don't you feed them? Let's feed them. Lord, if we emptied our treasury and spent everything we had to get them food, 
with this crowd, 5,000 men and plus women and children, with this crowd, that we wouldn't be able to give everybody a single bite to eat. Think about it. He's like, I've been thinking about it. So what do you have? What do we, well, I don't, I don't, what, what do we got? They kind of do a quick look and, uh, oh, well, we got one boy here. He brought five loaves and fish. <laughs> That's not really that much against this great crowd. We really need to send them home, Jesus. It's getting later. He says, have them all sit down. He says, I'll, I'll take that offering. I can do something with that. And so he takes the offering and he feeds the crowd with it. And it's one of the stories that they did find room to put in the Scripture. Because there were so many things Jesus did that if they had written all of them down, they'd still be writing today. Uh, it was just going to take forever. So they just chose a few, and this was one of them. Because, but God was looking for a gift. And when somebody was willing to give, now, no, won't go there. But when somebody was willing to give, the boy that gave his lunch, I imagine he got more out of this than anybody. I don't know if he got to keep the 12 baskets full of fragments left over afterwards or not. Uh, but even if he didn't get none of that, he got more than anybody. Why? Because he was the one that gave. And God blesses the giver. There was a time where the prophet Elijah prophesied about a famine that was to come. A drought. It's not going to rain. And it came just like he said. And for a while, God is providing for Elijah supernaturally while he is at a brook, drinking from the water. Ravens would bring him steak every morning and every evening. He's doing all right. Other people are kind of struggling. But eventually, that brook dries up because there's no rain. And uh, in the meantime, God speaks to a Gentile woman, not even a Jew. God speaks to a Gentile woman. A woman who's a widow who has just one son, a young son, and uh, tells her to take care of the prophet. Bible doesn't say she acted on it, so I don't know. Maybe she is waiting for Elijah to get there. But at some point, God tells Elijah, look, I want you to go to Zarephath, and there, which was a Gentile city, but there's a widow there that I have commanded. It's past tense. She's already commanded her to take care of the prophet. He said, I commanded her to sustain thee, so go there. So Elijah gets up, he makes his track, he gets there, and he finds her picking up sticks, going to make herself a little fire. She didn't have an electric stove. And collecting the sticks, and, and uh, I don't know if God gave Elijah a picture of what she looked like, or whatever, anyhow he knew that she was the one. And he tells her, hey, could you make me a meal? Make me a cake. If you go by the Italian Bible, it's a pizza. But whatever, I'm good with all of it. And uh, so make me a meal out of uh, what you're going to make so that I can eat. And she looks and she says, well, you know, I only have a little bit of meal left in the barrel and only have a little bit of oil in the cruise. And uh, it's just enough to, to make one last small meal. And and I'm gathering these sticks here so I can cook that meal. But my son and I were going to eat it, and then we were going to die. And Elijah's like, but you need to give something. I'll tell you what, you make me a meal first. He wasn't being selfish, but he knew the voice of God. He knew the way God operated. He said, make me a meal first. And then after that, you can make it for, for you, yourself, and your, your son. Because the Lord is saying that that meal in, the, in that barrel is not going to waste away and the cruise of oil will not fail until the day that the Lord sends rain on the earth. So she went and obeyed Elijah, and she made uh, the meal. And, and uh, just like Elijah said, for however long it was, months, years maybe after that, that until the rains came, that she was able to sustain the three of them off that little bit of meal that just would not go empty in that barrel. God looked for her to give something. She didn't get her miracle until she gave it. 
oh, I'll give God as soon as I hit the lot of, you know, I'm going to give. I'm, pro- I'm probably going to give you half of that, you know. Okay. I'll pay tithe and then maybe a little bit later on. I don't, I don't know. I've got some big plans, God. But, you know, we get so protective of what we give to God. When what God has is so much more than what you have, and all he looks for is that you're willing to give it. But we're so insistent on not giving it. The Bible tells a story where David had a number of the people of Israel got in trouble for it. He wasn't supposed to do it. Judgment was coming on the children of Israel. There was a great disease that was unleashed. Thousands were dying. And David was like, I can't have this. This is all my fault. Can't have people dying on my behalf. And uh, so he is told by the prophet to go out to uh, Ornan's threshing floor and there purchase a, a uh, uh, or uh, there offer up a sacrifice to God. Well, David goes up and Ornan sees David coming. And he's like, oh, King David, I'm so glad to have you here. What are you here for? Hey, listen, Ornan, I'm not really here on good terms. I, I, I mean, I, I got to I gotta offer up a sacrifice to God. There's, there's lots of people dying because of what I did. I, I need to offer up a sacrifice. And I was told that I have to do it here on your threshing floor here. Uh, and so uh, if I, I'll just buy, I'll pay for everything, you know, just, just let me offer up a sacrifice here. Ornan. He loved David, great, great king of Israel. And he's like, oh, no, David, you need to offer up a sacrifice to God. It's all yours, buddy. You can have it. I'll give you the land here. I'll give you the threshing floor. I'll give you the tools, the instruments, everything needed to create the sacrifice or offer up, to build an altar. You can have it all, David. I believe in you. I'm behind you 100%. Everybody else can see you're actually offering up the sacrifice. And David's like, no, I can't do that, Ornan. Can't do it. What do you mean? I, I, I can't take it for free from you. I've got to pay you. And I'm not buying it at a discount either. I'm going to pay you full price for it. Whatever the market is, I, I Kelly Blue Book, I want the top of the market. Whatever the top of the range is, I, I'm going to pay you full price for it. Well, why? He said, I cannot offer up to God that which costs me nothing. Because God knows the value of the gift. And it's easy for us to say, oh, here you go, God. I don't have use for this anymore. I'll donate that to the church. I got a brand new one. Or whatever it is. that we give God leftovers. I had nothing else to do today, so I'll go ahead and I'll go to church. Or, or you know what, these other plans fell through. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. Or I'll spend a moment in prayer because my favorite show got canceled. You know, the game got rained out or whatever. And whatever. And we can find ways to offer up unto God that which doesn't cost us a whole lot. For some folks, it's hard to drive to church. And other folks, they had to endure beatings in order to get to church. Some folks, well, when I was in Ethiopia, I would see them as I came in on a bus in America. Had kind of blessings. I'd watch them walking over the hills as we would. Yeah, they've been walking for days getting here. Took a week off. See that pack on their back? Yep. A bunch of sugar cane. That's all they're going to survive on for a week or two, however long it takes them to walk to the crusade, to the uh, conference we were holding, and then to uh, stay there and then to walk all the way back. That's all they were going to eat on all day long for several days. And walk for, for miles over a period of a week or two weeks, just depending on how long it was, where they were at, in order to get there where God was going to move. And then you wonder why in those uh, meetings every single year we saw blinded eyes open. We saw deaf ears unstopped. Uh, we saw lepers cleansed. Uh, we saw the dead raised. Uh, actually, every year we saw uh, devils cast out. We saw phenomenal moves of God. Why? Because they weren't offering up unto God that which cost them nothing. Uh, they were saying, I'm going to let it cost me. Uh, I'm going to give up to God uh, my very best. God looks for a gift. In the almost a week before 
Jesus was crucified. He's coming near Jerusalem, and he is invited to a, uh, a feast in Bethany. Bethany was a town where Lazarus lived, where he had been raised from the dead. So Jesus had been there before, more than once. And, of course, now that it was a kind of a more recent thing that Lazarus had been raised from the dead, um, it, people were even that much more excited that there was going to be not just a feast, but that Jesus was going to be there. And it was being hosted by a guy named Simon. Uh, Simon um, was very wealthy. He had money. Uh, he had influence. He had power. But Simon had a problem. Simon was a leper. Um, you know somebody else that was related to Simon. Um, uh, you know one of his sons, very, very, very well known. You've heard of Judas Iscariot? All right. So he had an in with Jesus. Judas had been following Jesus for three and a half years. His dad, Simon, throws a, a, a feast, uh, and, and Jesus and his disciples are there. And while they're there, you know, uh, maybe we can see a little bit of where uh, Judas's um, wicked heart was uh, because Judas was, you know, even he was smart. He had things together. Uh, he was the one that was chosen to, to manage their money, but he was the thief. And he was always taking things out of there and, and living high off of the, the excesses of the church for himself, you know, and, and uh, the excesses of, of Jesus' ministry. But, but uh, and his dad was wealthy. It's not like he needed it. But Simon throws this, this, uh, this feast, and, and while they're sitting there, in comes this woman who uh, Jesus knew her. And, and, you know, is Jesus, friends, Lazarus, Mary, Martha, um, they weren't always the best of people before Jesus came around. In fact, Mary did not have a very good reputation, if you know what I mean. And so Mary comes in. You get this as you piece together some of the scriptures. I know there was two different times somebody came in and washed Jesus' feet. But this time at the end of Jesus' ministry, Mary comes in. Her brother has just been raised from the dead not too long beforehand. And she comes in, and she has this alabaster box of an ointment called spikenard. Very, very expensive. Saved up. Who knows how long it took her to save up the money to get this. The alabaster box was very nice, but, but the ointment in it was even that much more expensive. And sealed off, and she comes in, and with all the brokenness in her heart, she breaks that box, and she pours out the whole alabaster, the whole spikenard, all of it, on Jesus' feet. I mean, she doesn't even just, you know, take a drop or two to, a, to anoint it, and that's it. And she just pours the thing out. Some of those that were sitting there, Simon, probably Judas, he's been known to do a thing like this too, where they're like, oh, what a waste. All that money, that thing, you could have sold it for a fortune. We could have fed the poor. They didn't say it with their mouth, but the Bible tells us that Jesus knew that's what they thought in their heart. And, uh, and the truth is, Judas wasn't interested in really helping the poor, but that was the excuse, you know, virtue signaling, a lot of folks do. And, uh, and so, there were some of them all upset. It was a waste of that ointment. could have been sold for more than 300 pence. Remember, when Jesus fed the 5,000, they were talking about we've got 200 pence in the kitty, and that's not enough to feed all these. Now they got 300, or, or at least this spike arm could have done 300 pence. Wow, they, they would have really been sitting up good. And Jesus said, let her alone. Why are you troubling her? She has wrought a good work on me. The poor, you'll always have with you. You'll never wipe out poverty. 
uh, because poverty is induced by man, it's produced by man. It's in, in, uh, done by governments, oppressive, large, heavy-handed governments that keep their people in poverty. Uh, in fact, all the poverty in the world, the, well, the majority of, of, of the famines in the world, they are done, they're government-induced by their own governments on their own people. But even if it wasn't that bad, poverty you'll always have because people engage in the acts that produce poverty rather than engage in what God has given them the power to do, which is to create wealth. So Jesus said, the poor you'll always have with you. And whenever you want to do them good, you can do that. But you'll not always have me. She has done what she could. She's come beforehand to anoint my body to the burying. Oh my God. And then he says, this thing that she has done, this sacrifice, this offering, this gift that she gave, it is going to be a memorial for her throughout the whole world. Everywhere the gospel is preached, the story is going to be told as a memorial to her. What was the memorial? It was her giving. And she gave a gift that God paid attention to. It's not always the amount of the gift, but if the gift doesn't cost you anything, then don't expect a whole lot. Sometime later, there was a Gentile who had a great fear of God. He wasn't even a Jew. He's a Gentile. He's a part of a group that the Jews despise. But he gave much alms to the people. And he prayed to God always. This is what the Bible says about him, so we know it's true. It wasn't just his reputation. He actually did it. He gave much alms to the people. He prayed to God always. And to him appeared in a vision the angel of the Lord and said unto him, Cornelius, Cornelius. And he looked up and he said, here am I. And, Corn and the angel begins to tell him, Cornelius, your prayers and your alms that you're giving has come up for a memorial before God. All the prayers that he gave. All, he could have spent that time doing something else. He could have spent that time enjoying luxury. But the time he spent instead in prayer and the time he spent giving of himself and of what he had, God said, it has built a memorial here in heaven so much so that I've got to do something about it. I'm going to bless you even though you weren't asking for one. And I'm going to visit you with an angel. How many others love that? Oh, I'd love to see an angel. No, I'm not going to get any. And so that angel tells Cornelius where he can find the man of God so he can hear the gospel of salvation and be saved. Memorial. See, every time you give, a gift to God, everything you give, whether it's a gift of monetary value, it's a sacrifice of praise. The Bible even talks about the sacrifices of joy. Sometimes you've got to offer a sacrifice of joy to God. But when those things are accepted by God, they build up a memorial. Stand with me, if you will. When God looks for a gift, Psalm 50 and verse 5, he said, gather my saints together unto me. My saints, yeah, gather those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. See, our, our covenants with God are not just what we lip off. We need to pay attention to what we say to God. But it's what we give by sacrifice. God looks for a gift. Not because he needs your gift, but it opens the door for him then to bless you. But when we come to God with a gift, 
We want to come knowing the value of a gift. If I'm just singing a song, not even thinking about it, thinking about what I'm going to do this afternoon, thinking about whatever else, not much of a sacrifice, huh? Bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Give your energy. Give your passion. Give your heart. Give your life. You want to give a gift to God that he pays respect to. That like Abel, he receives his offering. Here we are, Jesus, coming to you right now. Even in body, coming to the front. But God, we're coming to you because we're determined to give a gift that counts. It's the thought behind the gift. But we're not going to try to lie to you because that would only be lying to ourselves about the value of the gift and giving you that which costs us nothing. want to be like David. He said, if I give to God, I can't just give him that that doesn't cost me anything. I want to give something very valuable. If it's an alabaster box of spike nard. One songwriter said, you don't know the cost of my worship the cost of my praise. You don't know the cost of what I offer up to God. And, this, and the world will try to get you to look at, oh, but you could, you could have the whole world. You could have all of this. You pursue these things in, in the world. But, but, but even if I could get them from the world, most of the time it's a lie. But even if I could, I want to place that on the altar. I want to give God a sacrifice that he's pleased with, a sweet-smelling sacrifice, a sweet-smelling savor unto him, something that God looks at and says, oh, I'm pleased with that. That reflects to me the giving nature. Here I am, oh God. Because I'm not just giving you a moment on a Sunday morning. But I'm giving you my life. All that I am. All that I have. All that I can be. And all that I am not. I place it in your hands. Jesus taught, taught us that it's the gift. Whatever touches the gift is sanctified by the gift. And the altar, giving it to God, is what sanctifies the gift. It's worth more than all the gold and whatever. It's, what matters is it's sanctified. So we place it at God's feet. And so if we have to come like Mary, wash his feet with our tears, it's worth it. Whatever sacrifice, other people talking about you, we know your reputation. We know what you're like. We know what you've done. Doesn't matter, I'm going to give the best of what I got. It's not my life. I think the spike dart's worth more than my life is. I've been so bad. I've been so low. But Jesus looks at that sacrifice. He said, I wasn't expecting perfection. That's what I give. That's what I do for you. That's what I do in you. 
I was just looking for him. Simon, when I came into your place, you didn't wash my feet. You didn't dry my feet after having washed them. You didn't do any of that for me. Simon, you're a leper. After three and a half years, you would have known how many lepers have been healed from my ministry. You would have known how much I could have done for you. If you'd have been willing to give me, Simon, some, maybe if you'd have washed my feet, you'd have got your healing from your leprosy. But no, you were so wrapped up in yourself that you could not give. But this woman, who probably wasn't even invited to the party, comes in, begins to weep. Show her love for Jesus. Jesus, if it wasn't for you, I'd be lost. I'd be minus a brother. I'd be ostracized from the community. Can you give a sacrifice to God this morning that he will accept? offer up praise that's going to cost you something? Can you offer up a worship that's going to cost you some dignity? It's going to cost you some love? It's going to cost you some energy? Some movement? Can you give something to God that costs you something? God, I want to be received by you. I've got to offer up a, an offering that, that's an extension of me, an offering that represents me, an offering that tells you the value of how I see you. You are worthy of me. You are worthy of everything. It doesn't matter if it's my personality or not. It doesn't matter if I'm comfortable or not. It doesn't matter my history or not. What matters is you. You're worthy of anything. I can't possibly. 